James chapter 5, verses 14 through 20. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that it may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain on the earth, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. This passage is talking about people being sick and the elders of the church coming and praying over them and the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith, this is the only time it is mentioned here in the Bible in this way. And if you look in this passage, prayer is mentioned in between verses 13 through 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 times. And prayer is a very interesting subject and a very powerful subject. And, and one might ask the question, why do we need to pray? You have to go back all the way to creation. And Psalms chapter 8 says, verse 3 through 9, When I considered the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor. Thou made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever pass through the paths of the sea. O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. When God created Adam at the beginning, he gave him dominion, and that meant he had authority over the earth. And if you if you look through the whole Bible, God doesn't do anything on the earth without a man being involved. In fact, he even says that he that he reveals the secrets to the prophets before even he does something. He he tells it to the prophets, and man has to be involved. Therefore, if a miracle or if we need God's help, we have to pray to him because man needs God, and God will only help if he's asked. He's not just going to come down and supersede the authority of mankind. So to get things done on the earth, if you want God to help you, you have to pray. And prayer is asking God for help and asking him to bless you. And that's the reason why prayer is so important, because God's in heaven and he's given authority to man. And we know that Jesus took authority over the earth, but he still has given a lot of authority to man and when I say man, I'm talking about men and women, that God has ordained for them to have authority on the earth and that God has to be invited into our lives and asked. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. If you don't ask God for help, you're not going to get it. And he has done all these wonderful things in Christ. Jesus died on the cross. By his stripes you were healed. He took authority over the whole earth. And we're, we're entitled to miracle signs and wonders, and we're entitled to the help of God. He made a covenant to help us. He made promises to help us. But we have to call upon the name of the Lord, and he will be there to answer us. For those that call. But if you don't call upon the Lord, you don't ask for his help. The Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you, you could go through something, and God could have been there to help you. So here in James, he's talking about when someone's sick. or you, It could be any problem, but we're going to take, it's talking about sickness here. But it moves into Elijah about praying for rain and for it to start and stop. So we know that this principle works in all areas of life. So when you're talking about prayer, prayer is very important. So as you read through here, as and you look at the different definitions for prayer. In verse 13, it says, it's any... Among you afflicted, let him pray. Well, that that word for prayer, and I won't be able to totally pronounce it in the Greek, but it's pro e um, It's the best I can pronounce it, but it's a Greek word. And it refers to praying to God to receive something good from him and to advert evil. In verse 14, the word prayer says, And let them pray over him, anoint him to the law in the name of the Lord. Now that word is the same word in the Greek. 
and means to pray to God to receive something good and to advert evil. Now, when it gets to verse 15 and it says, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, when you look up that definition, you can go to your Strong's Concordance, it means to wish or to pray or a vow. So it's a whole different word being used here and it's talking about a vow. And how could a vow have anything to do with the prayer of faith? Very interesting. We're going to get into that. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up. If you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. That's the same word there for prayer of faith that's used to wish or a vow. Verse 17, when it talks about Elijah and he prayed earnestly that it may not rain, it goes back to the other word for prayer, originally referring to God, praying to God to receive something good and to advert evil. And then in verse 18, and he prayed again. That's going back to the same word about to receive something good and avert evil. So here we find in the middle of this passage and all these times where prayer is mentioned that it's a different word used when it's talking about the prayer of faith. So you, why would it use a different word? You have So you have to really go into detail and you have to look at the whole passage. It's talking about praying. It's talking about someone being sick. It's talking about them sinning and their sinning has caused the sickness or the sickness has come because they sin and that's why they need to confess their faults and pray that they may be healed meaning they need they need to do something here to clear up their sins before they're going to be healed then it talks about a righteous person praying like elijah the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much so the prayer of a righteous person or someone in right standing with god someone not sinning right standing they're not in sin they're in right standing with god they have the power to pray and it avails much just like elijah had the power to pray he stopped the rain and he started it and then and then at the end in verse 19 and 20 you can't leave this out but if any but if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him let him know that he which converted the sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide him will do sin so it gets back into sin again so this whole passage is talking about sin prayer sickness and righteous people praying and causing something to happen where the person can get healed and if someone's going through something and this principle can work in any area any type of deliverance and we'll get into that so getting back to the prayer faith and it having to do with a vow so what is a vow a vow is something that a person verbally speaks to god that they make an oath to do something or not do something and in, in the Bible, in Numbers, it says, If a man vow unto the Lord to swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Uh, that's Numbers 30, verse number 2. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21 through 23 says, And when thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord God, thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall not be sin. So, I mean, you can vow or not vow. That which has gone out of thy lips, thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast performed with thy mouth. So, you know, we're talking about a vow here, and we're talking about the prayer of faith. And then there's a couple of the verses here in Psalms that says, uh, In God have I put my trust, I will not be afraid. What can man do unto me? Thy vows are upon me, O God, and I will render praises unto thee. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me a hair to those that fear thy name. So vows are very important in the Bible and in the, in the Old Testament in particular. Uh, Samson had a vow as a Nazarite. He wasn't supposed to shave his head. And, and when his head got shaved, he broke the vow and he lost his strength. Ecclesiastes, which is a book that Solomon wrote, says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou should not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an angel that was an heir. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the works of thy hands? So vows are something very, very important to God in the Bible. Not to be taken lightly. When you go to make one, you have to keep it. Now this word vow that is used here in James is found two other times in the in the new testament it's a greek word i'm going to read 
where it's used. In Acts chapter 18, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with you, and no man shall set on you to hurt thee, for I have much people in the city. He's going to a city to preach the gospel, and he continued there three years and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And when Gallio was the Deptychia, the Jews, and when Galilee was the Deptychia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. So they came against Paul, saying, This fellow persuaded men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Galilee said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or, uh, or wrong or wicked lewdness, or you Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it's a question about words and names of your law, look you into it, for I will not judge of such matters. And he drove them before the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment. And Galilee cared for none of those things. And after Paul, and Paul after this tarried there yet a good while, and then he took his leave to the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centuria, for he had a vow. So Paul makes a vow here. After all this happens, Paul makes a vow. Then in Acts chapter 21, it says, And the day following, Paul went into James. So now, now Paul is going to speak to James, which is now leading the church in Jerusalem. And the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews which are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after their customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must come needs together, for they will hear that thou art come. So he goes before James, and James says, Look, everyone says that you're teaching something that they're not supposed to keep the law of Moses. And this is, gets very interesting because this, this is getting in now into sin. What is sin? And the Jews define sin, obviously, by the law of Moses. And so are we supposed to judge, judge sin according to the law of Moses? Or, there, or, or what is sin? But he's in this situation, and... He's a Jew, and the Jews are saying, you're not keeping the law, and you're telling all the Gentiles not to keep the law. And then he says, do this, therefore, we say, for we have four men which have a vow on them. So we see that there was a vow um, placed upon these men. And he says, them take and purify thyself with them. And be at charge of them that they may shave their head. So they're shaving their head, kind of like doing a Nazareth thing, and let their hair grow out. And all may know that those things were for you, they were confirmed in thee, concerning they are nothing, but that thou thyself also walked orderly and keep the law of Moses. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing. So he's saying the Gentiles do not need to keep the law, but if you're a Jew, you need to keep the law. So this is very important. We're talking about sin. As touching the Gentile, we believe, which are written and included, that they observe no such thing, save only they keep themselves from things offered to idols, and from blood, and from strangled, and from fornication. Then Paul took them in, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of his purification, until that an offering should be offered for everyone, every one of them. So here we're seeing that the law was how the Jews were governing if someone was sinning or not. And obviously we know the law came from God. God spoke the Ten Commandments. He spoke many laws, 613 different laws, in fact. And they were saying, you're a Jew, you have to keep these laws. But the Gentiles that are Christians, they and this was a big argument that was going back and forth in the church. And it still goes on today for that matter. And people are confused. Do I need to keep the law? Do I not keep the law? And sin, because if you're if you're looking over here in James, and it says the paraphrase shall save the sick and confess your faults, well, we have to define what sin is if we're going to understand how someone's going to be forgiven, and if someone can get healed based upon the fact if they sinned or didn't sin or if they repented of their sins. So we know this is talking about a vow, and we know we're talking about sin. And I'm going to give you a mystery out of the Bible as we go here and about a mystery that the Lord gave me about the prayer of faith and we're going to get into this a little deeper but before I get into that we need to discuss the issue of sin what is sin that's what is sin how, how do we know if we're sinning or not it's a great question to ask 
Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God's at hand. Repent means to repent of your sins, turn, turn away, stop doing what you're doing, have a change of heart and mind. Well, what are they supposed to repent of? Well, here we know that John the Baptist was a Jew, preaching to Jews, so we know he was telling them to get back to the law, obviously. For this, and, and we know that he prepared the way of Christ. For this is the one that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now when Jesus came on the scene, it says, From that time Jesus began, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse number 17, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. Mark chapter 1, verse 15, says, And saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So here he's talking about repent. Repent means you need to repent of your sins. And we know when they repented of their sins, there were tons of healings that took place in the ministry of Jesus. But you have to realize John the Baptist came on the scene and he prepared the way. And how he prepared the way is he had them all repentant of their sins. So they were prepared to receive healing. So here in James chapter 5, the prayer of faith, Jesus could pray over them, pray the prayer of faith. And they got healed because John the Baptist had them all repent. And Jesus was teaching them to repent also. And so these people were prepared through the ministry of repentance of John the Baptist. And that's why there were so many healings healings that took place in the ministry of Jesus. John the Baptist prepared the way by preaching repentance. Now John the Baptist didn't have any miracles himself, but Jesus did them. And Jesus saw so many miracles, so many signs and wonders, it was just unbelievable. So what is sin? So I'm going to define sin for you now a little different than what you might have thought. So let's go to Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 26. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not feel the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the law are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulence, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, and drunkenness, revelings, and such the like. Of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So I want to pose to you today that sin is, we're no longer as Christians held accountable to like all the law of Moses. In fact, we couldn't keep the law anyways because the temple was destroyed and Jesus fulfilled the law when he died on the cross and he said it is finished. He fulfilled all the law. And then he told the disciples to go out and, and start preaching the gospel of the whole world. They went to the Gentiles. The Gentiles received the Spirit. And then there was an argument. Do they have to keep the law? And they said, no, they don't have to keep all the law. But they have, but but you have to stay away from the works of the flesh. And now the works of the flesh are fully covered in the law also, like adultery, fornication, all the witchcraft. These things are still covered in the law, but we have to repent of any of these things. Jesus also said in Mark chapter 7, verses 14, we'll read through 23, And when he had called all the people unto me, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there is nothing from without a man that entering in can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. And he's doing this because he's trying to, the, the Jews are trying to say, you got to wash your hands, you got to do all these things, all these ceremonies, and that's what makes you clean. And he says, look, none of these things make you clean. It's not what you do on the outside. It's what's coming from within you that's making you dirty. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said to them, are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into a man, it cannot defile him? Food can't defile you? Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the drop, purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, Thefts, covetous, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So if I were you, I would definitely read Galatians chapter 5, uh, 16 through 21. And it lists the works of the flesh, which pretty much line up here with what Jesus just listed. This is Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. And he gives a list. These evil things come from within. So <clears throat> the law was given 
by Moses, but it was written on tables and he said, and the new covenant that we have in God, you can find what the new covenant is. And when Jesus, before he went to the cross, Matthew chapter 26, verses 20, uh, 26, verses 26 through 30, it says, and they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink you all of it. For this is the my blood of the new covenant or new testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins so the blood of jesus is what's going to now cover sins not going to be the blood and blood of bulls and goats in the old testament but i say unto you i will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine till that day when i drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom and when they had sung a hymn they went out to the mount of olives so Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 30 says that when before Jesus went on the cross, he was establishing a new covenant. Now we know what this new covenant is. So we have to go to Jeremiah and we can read it. And it's also found in Hebrews. But I'll read it in Jeremiah first. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. They broke it, although I was a husband unto them. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. So let's talk about the forgiveness of sin. And here, and we know this is the new covenant because we can read about it in Hebrews chapter 10 in the New Testament. Uh, verses 10, verses 15 through 31. Or I'll just read through, read through here. Actually go to 28. Wherefore the Holy Ghost is a witness for us, for that he said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds while I write them. So now he's talking about writing his laws on your heart. And this is coming from Jeremiah. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Meaning we can go to God now by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So we know that when we are baptized, that's a symbol of washing our body. And the blood of Jesus, when it comes upon a new Christian or a new believer, when they confess Christ, the blood of Jesus is sprinkled on their evil conscience. And from that point, the laws of God are, are written on their heart and they no longer want to sin. I know when I became a Christian, I wanted to stop sinning. No one even told me that, to do it. And I, there were things I was doing and I just stopped on my own because I knew it was wrong. Because the blood of Jesus was sprinkled on my conscience and the laws of God were written there. Then it goes on to say, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a, cer a certain fearful looking of judgment and fire and indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So the new covenant is the blood of Jesus being sprinkled on your heart and the laws of God. And the laws of God, you will not want to commit any of the works of the flesh listed in Galatians. It also says in Romans, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, meaning how to live right before God and be right standing with God. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the blood is sprinkled upon an evil conscience. The conscience revives. So therefore, a big part of the New Testament Christian is not sinning with their conscience. So if your conscience tells you not to do something, don't do it. If you disobey your conscience, you are disobeying the laws of God written on your heart by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. Your conscience may not always be right, but it's never right to go against it. God gave you a conscience. And it says in um, Romans chapter 2, For there is no respect to person of God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. 
For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law or a law unto themselves, meaning their conscience. And how do you know that? Because look at the next verse. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing them, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men according uh, uh, by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So he's clearly talking about your conscience and God judging you by that conscience. Now going back to Romans, it says, Therefore, where God, it says, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like an incorruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creepy things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. This is Romans chapter 1. Who changed the truth of God, God into a lie. They changed God's truth into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working which is, that which is unseemly, receiving in himself the recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now, a reprobate mind is someone that just disobeys their conscience over and over again, and then they actually believe the lie is true. They think they're not even sinning or they're not even doing anything right. But there was a time that their conscience convicted them, but they just pushed right past it. And, that, and God's going to judge people for that. To do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers. They don't make oaths. They don't make brows. When they do, they break them. They break their vows, break their covenant. Without natural affection, implicable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do it. So we know it's a very, very big deal to go against your conscience. And you're going, that blood is sprinkled on your heart. And, and to go back to Hebrews, it says, Of how much more sore punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy, who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite to the Spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. And I, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall to the hands of the living God. So the blood of Jesus is sprinkled on the heart. And people's conscience are revived. The laws of God are now written on there. And it, and it lists the laws of God go against the works of the flesh listed that I've listed in three different passages now. But in Galatians, over here in Romans, and it talks about the this and also the the things that Jesus even preached like to not do these things but the conscience now is an interesting subject because the conscience is something we have to protect and I want to read out of Romans chapter 14 because this is very very interesting a situation and um, him that is weak in the faith remember we're going back to the prayer of faith and about people's sins being forgiven and I want to pull it back into that message and we, we went over here to talk about what sin is because how can you know what you need to repent of if you don't even know what it is so we, we clarified what sin is it's not just keeping the law it's, it's staying away from the works of the flesh Romans chapter 14 verses 1 through 23 says, Him that is weak in the faith receive you, but not to doubtful disputations or arguments. For one believeth he may eat all things, another who is weak eats herbs. So he's talking about someone that can eat whatever they want, another person only eat herbs. Let not him that dis eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? For to his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So he's talking about people's belief system. Should I eat this, not eat that, right? Uh, should I keep these holy days, not keep these holy days? Verse number six, he that regardeth the day regardeth unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day 
to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. But he that eateth not to the Lord, he is not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dies to himself. For whether we live unto the Lord, or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you set it not your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So he's talking about all these different issues in life. And should I eat this, not eat that? And it really gets into the law of Moses. But we know most importantly that we have to stay away from the works of the flesh. But we also have to guard our conscience. And this is going to get very interesting what I'm going to read here. Because this has everything to do with your faith. And the Bible says the just shall live by faith. And this is actually the just shall live by their conscience. And let me just read a little farther. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us therefore, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So he said, don't judge other people, but don't put a stumbling block, meaning don't cause your brother to stumble and sin. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ or the Lord Jesus, that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him is unclean. So he's saying, hey, nothing's unclean. You know, if you're if you're staying away from the works of the flesh and all these other issues, it goes, but if you esteem it to be unclean, it's unclean to you, but it may not be what you eat, don't eat, days you stay. But if your brother be grieved with your meat, now thou walkest not charity. So now someone might have a problem with it. And now he's saying, look, it might be okay for you to do it, but if your brother has a problem, don't do it because it's going to hurt them. And let's find out how it hurts them. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let then, not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteous and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is accepted of God and proved of men. Let us therefore follow after things which make for peace, wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Meaning, if why are you doing this and it's offending your brother? Don't do it in front of your brother if it, if it weakens them. It is good neither to eat flesh nor drink wine nor any other thing whereby my brother stumbles or is offended or made weak. Now check this out, verses 22 and 23. These, these verses are so amazing. This ties in with the, with the prayer of faith. Have thou faith? Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the things which he allows. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So to clarify this, what he's talking about is your conscience. Your conscience has everything to do with what you believe to be right or wrong. Your conscience isn't always right, but it's never right to go against it. Your conscience will grow in knowledge. So he's saying here, this one brother thinks he can't eat. You feel it's okay. He says, it really doesn't matter, but don't do it if, this guy, if you're going to wound this guy. And he says, do everything by faith, meaning you have to feel good about it. So your faith gets into your conscience, it gets into your belief system, and, it, and it, it's basically, if you feel you've sinned, repent. If Your own heart can condemn you. Our heart can, can do more to beat us up than even a human can. Even a religious spirit cannot beat you up more than your own heart can if you go against it. So if you've gone against your conscience or you're in and it will definitely line up with the works of the flesh, you're doing any of the works of the flesh, your conscience will condemn you unless you have seared your conscience and then you become reprobate but at some point you knew it was wrong now i believe that those that are hearing this message are not in that situation you actually are seeking god you want a clean heart and god's telling you to have a clean heart is just obey your conscience and stay awake from the works of the flesh and you'll be right before the lord but if you do any of those things a sickness can come upon you so if you have a sickness and you have an illness or you have some curse on you and you know it came from sin you have to repent about that sin. Now, Jesus, um, and I'm going to tell a couple stories about Jesus. But before I get into that, I'm going to reveal the secret of this message. And going back to James chapter 5 in the prayer of faith, right? Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. 
Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him and then, and then anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins. Now, sometimes the sickness can come upon you and it's not because you sinned. And Jesus even said, we, live, we just live in a cursed world and some people can get a sickness. And we'll get into the prayer of faith because the prayer of faith can be offered for someone that is for sinning or not sinning maybe just came upon you your conscience is clean and and just something bad happened to you and that can happen in life but sometimes sickness has come upon people because they sinned jesus even said to one man go and sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you this is the man that he healed when he was lying <clears throat> he was lying at a pool and the angel will come down and heal people and and he was there for many years for 38 years and he never was healed and jesus healed him but then after jesus finds him in the temple said behold thou art made whole sin no more jesus also said to this to the woman caught in adultery and when jesus lifted himself up and saw in this john chapter 8 saw none but the woman he said to her woman where are thy accusers hath no man condemned thee she said no man and jesus said to her neither do i condemn thee go and sin no more which is interesting because now we're talking about repentance has to do with being forgiven of past sins but jesus is talking about future tense go and sin no more he said this twice so we we know that jesus isn't a liar so if no one if it wasn't possible for someone to go and sin no more quit sinning then he wouldn't have said that and some people feel they're sinning when and they talk well i can never sin no more when they're talking about the weakness of who they are as a person and their maybe their confidence is down but that does not mean you're living in sin or breaking your conscience or breaking any of the works of the flesh and you might just be growing and developing but there are people though that they know they've sinned they know they brought a sickness upon them because that uh, they did something and the sickness has now hit them or a demon's attacking them or something you know demons operate by permission and and basically you can give a demon permission by sin if you commit a sin then the permission is given and they can come in and do something to your body inhabit your body put sicknesses upon you so the prayer of faith now I want to bring you to the crux of a revelation here remember how I said that it was a vow so another way you could read in the prayer of faith shall save the sick you could read a vow prayer of faith will save the sick so why would you why would this word prayer mean vow and you can look it up yourself it's it's the uh ushe i believe it is how you say it in the greek and it's a different word that's used from these other words in prayer back in james what god is saying here is he's looking for one the person that's going to pray over you has made a vow that they're not going to sin anymore they repented and they made a vow to god i'm going to go and sin no more just like jesus said to these two people behold thou art made whole sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you a sickness so he's saying you got to make a commitment you need to make a vow that you're not going to sin anymore so it's one thing to repent Right And through repentance, we, when we repent, that's referring to past sins. But God's saying, you need to make a vow that you're not going to sin anymore. Like he said to the woman caught in adultery, like what? Can she just commit adultery? Jesus forgive her. They don't stone her. Then she just goes and continues to live in adultery and nothing happened. No, she needs to continue in the righteousness of God and quit sinning. And she needs to make a vow. I'm not going to sin anymore. Just right here. That's why this was put here. This whole thing is about confessing your faults one to another. And about let him that know that he that converts a sinner from the error of his way. Meaning, meaning this sinner doesn't just repent of their sins and just keep on sinning over and over and over again that is called spitting on the spirit of grace when you when you become a christian you die to your flesh and when you're risen up from the baptism into newness life you're making a commitment i'm not going to live in sin anymore if you go back to your sins you're like a dog returning to his vomit so what's so wonderful here is i had never seen this before and the holy spirit led me to this verse he told me to study it and i, and I was gonna i was thinking i was gonna go another direction which i'm gonna get into in just a moment about another aspect of the prayer of faith but he's saying you got to make a commitment 
not to sin anymore. You had to make a vow, an oath. I repent of my sins and I vow to God that I will not sin anymore. When you make that, then the person that prays over you, which is a righteous person who has made the same vow and he's walking right before the Lord or she, they have a right to pray over you the prayer of faith or the vow of faith. And that's been what it's saying is that you have repented of your sins they're not living in sin and they have a right before God to make a prayer over you and that the sickness will leave you. You will be healed if you repent of your sins and make a vow not to sin anymore. Go and sin no more. So how does this person, it says it's like a righteous man referring to Elijah and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rain not again, right? It says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, someone that's not living in sin, someone has a clean conscience, someone that's not doing the works of the flesh. They're in right standing for God. They have a right to make that prayer. So you have to ask yourself, uh, and, and it gets into who's God going to listen to. If you're, if you're living in sin and, and this, this prayer of faith is going to be offered, that means someone, an elder, a leader in the church is going to come to you. And they're gonna, and, and, and look, you're not going to get healed otherwise. Someone has to pray over you. If you look in the Bible, things didn't happen unless a man of God showed up. Jesus had to be there to speak to Lazarus for him to be healed. The shadow of Peter had to be there for people to be healed. But before I get into that, Psalm chapter 66, verse number 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold the, Lord's, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So we know God does not hear the prayers of sinners. And we know when Jesus healed the blind man that was born blind, this miraculous thing, and he's being challenged by the religious leaders, he made this statement, John chapter 9, verse 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. We know that God does not hear sinners, meaning he won't even hear them, won't even listen. Now, if God's going to hear your prayer, that means he's going to answer your prayer. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. If any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him he hears. So it's clearly God will not hear a righteous man's prayer. If he's living in sin, righteous, right? Meaning he's in right standing with God. We also know um, that Peter said, "Let him, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lip that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous ones not living in sin, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So I'm making a point here that the person that's going to offer the prayer of faith has had to have made a vow that he's not going to sin anymore. You are making a vow that you repent of your sins and you're not going to live in sin. Then he can offer this prayer. Now, what is, the prayer of faith also has to do with um, speaking to a mountain. It's important that someone has to speak to a mountain. And there's a story of this one gal, her husband had cancer and everyone was praying for him and and he was serving the Lord he was a Christian and he's, he's young and he ends up dying which happens to so many people remember the Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge so I'm gonna give you a secret here this guy dies and his wife is devastated she ends up going to this meeting where this man of faith is preaching about speaking to mountains and then moving she after the service she comes up to him and says i don't believe what you're preaching he says what do you mean you don't believe what i am preaching did i say anything wrong she says well my husband you know he was a christian and we had people praying everyone's praying and he still died so she's trying to say the bible's wrong well the lord said to this man of god that no one ever spoke to the cancer and therefore that's why he died he could have been saved. Now remember, this is so important. If there was no Noah, there would be no flood. If there was no Abraham, there would be no nation of Israel. If there was no Moses, there would be no deliverance from Egypt. If there was no Joshua, there would be no entering in to take the promised land. 
If there was no David, there would be no death of Goliath. If there was no Elijah, there'd no be, there wouldn't be any fire that came down and the rains wouldn't have started and stopped. If there was no John the Baptist, there would have been no baptism of Jesus. If there was no Jesus, there would have been no miracles or salvation of all mankind. If there was no Peter, there would no one be getting healed by his shadow. If there were no apostles out there preaching the gospel, there wouldn't be people getting saved. If there were no elders in the church, no one would be getting healed. If there isn't someone anointed by the Spirit and no gifts of the Spirit operation, nothing's going to happen. Meaning, God has to use a man and it's called the prayer of faith or maybe they lay hands on you, an act of faith or something. But God is not going to bypass a man being used. And a lot of people die and perish because they don't receive the anointing on another person. These anointings are here to help us and deliver us. And Jesus, when he, when he went to his hometown, he said, Were there not many widows? In is in Israel and in that land during that time of the famine and none were fed except for the one widow were there not many lepers during the time of Elisha and only one was healed why is that because they believed in the man of God God uses men and women of God to to do the anointing so someone has to be standing or yourself if you're gonna pray for yourself you have to be standing in right right place with God and the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much meaning it will bring the results you need when you're in right standing with God God will hear you now if you look at the story when Jesus went to Lazarus remember they said Lazarus was sick and Jesus waits a few days and Lazarus ends up dying when he gets there you know everyone's crying and um, and Jesus said take away the stone Martha the sister of him that was dead, saith him. And, and Lazarus was sick and he dies. And Jesus waits a few days he gets there. She says, by this time he stinks, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, said I not of thee, if thou wouldst believe, you should see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where he was, the dead was laid. And Jesus lift up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou always hearest me. Because of the people which I stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So here he's saying that he must, Jesus must have been praying about this situation about Lazarus being dead. And it says the father heard him. So he prayed. The father heard him, but Lazarus is still dead. And then look what happens. Verse 43, chapter 11. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. That is the prayer of faith. Jesus was standing as the righteous. We know he's God. But we know other men of God did this also. Elijah and Elisha raised people from the dead. Uh, Paul the Apostle, or sorry, Peter raised them from the dead. And so did Paul the Apostle. So he had to make a proclamation. It's not just good enough to go and pray and pray to God secretly. He had to get before the person that was dead or sick. And he had to speak over them. And that was the prayer of faith. Speaking and he spoke something. And that caused them to come alive. If Jesus would have not came and spoken, Lazarus come forth, he would have remained dead. Although God heard him, it was God's will for him to be healed. He would have stayed dead. Someone had to offer the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith... The prayer of faith is when someone anointed is anointed and right stand to God and they have to be living on the earth to offer the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith is someone who made a vow to God to not sin and the person they are praying for must be repentant or made a vow to God to not sin anymore. Once the issue of sin is dealt with, the person of faith who is in right standing with God can speak directly to the problem and command it to go. The healing will always occur when the requirements are met. The prayer, this prayer, will be commanding and it will set the captive free. The person speaking the prayer of faith cannot have any doubt in their heart and must believe what they say will come to pass. So then we get back over here to Mark 11 when Jesus was talking about speaking to a mountain. And Jesus saith unto them, saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he'll have whatever he says. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, shall have them. So here Jesus is saying, look, you've got to speak to the mountain. And so there's two parts of prayer. One part is when you pray to God and there's repentance going on and everyone's making sure that we can legally get a healing here. Hey, I'm not in sin. 
God can hear me. This person has repented of their sins or maybe they're not even in sin and they have a right to be healed. Just because they have a right to be healed doesn't mean they're going to be healed. Someone has to speak to the mountain and that's also a big part of the prayer of faith. Meaning someone speaks by faith. They have no doubt in the heart. They believe in their conscience that, hey, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, we know he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we have whatsoever we desire from John. book of John says. So, if you're in right standing with God, you can speak to a mountain. And remember, someone has to be in right standing with God, and someone's got to be repentant, and they need to make a vow to God that I'm going to go and sin no more. Just like Jesus said, you make a vow, and you have to think about that vow. That varies, That vow is very important. Now, I know people may have not have preached this way before, but you can do the research yourself. I view tons of verses here to help you. And God does raise people up. God uses men and women of God. And that's the great mystery of God. I, I've been to services and people think God's just going to magically come down and do it. And look, nothing's happening. Nothing's going to happen. It's not the way God ordained it. God ordained it for that there to be people on the earth that would have anointings and that they would speak the prayer of faith. They would speak to someone. They're in right standing. The person's repentant. And therefore, they have the power to offer the prayer of faith. 